we're not alone and have for many, many years, even though but at the time I went to the moon, it was the conventional wisdom, both in science and theology, that we were alone in the universe. We're just barely out of the trees, even though we think we're rather sophisticated. But I do like to tell the story that my great-grandparents came across from southern United States to the west after our Civil War. And I went to the moon yes, less than 100 years later they came across in covered wagons. So from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than a hundred years in our lifetime is a rather significant event that tells us how primitive we have been until the modern era, and we're still pr rather primitive. Uh, because of my uh, openness to these things, I did have many of the old timers in the military and in the uh, intelligence community over the years wanting to get it off their chest before they passed away uh, allowed me to interview them and talk to them about it. And so my ideas became fairly well solidified in the fact we've been visited. We have to remember that right after World War II, the Army Air Force was separated and became the, Ar became the Air Force, a separate branch of service. And that the of OSS, which was the Office of Special Services, was disbanded and eventually became the CIA. So that <clears throat> here was a major military organization and a major intelligence organization, totally in disarray, new founded, didn't know what they were doing after World War II and not really reorganized yet. And as a result of that, the President Truman at that time um, convened a very high level uh, committee to examine this alien or UFO phenomenon. They did come to the conclusion that it was alien, and the military uh, rightly came to the conclusion, if, this, if they're hostile, there's nothing we can do about it. Therefore, their choice was to deny it and to hush it up and create a, the National Security Act of 1947, which validated that uh, uh, deception and covered it up and allowed the group to go underground as it were. And we've been living with that now for 50 years. It is really the uh, beginning of the whole cover up, the, the entire denial of this phenomenon. And uh, the addition of dismissal, disinformation, misinformation uh, to cloak and to discourage uh, investigation, to misinform. It's just been continuous for many, many years now. Eventually it came away from the fear, I believe, of uh, not being able to protect and do their duty to uh, the notion of power and control, controlling the knowledge and the technology. And the group involved with that is still doing it. We have created our reality here and we have created it right now rather badly, for it's not a sustainable reality. We have created with our science and technology, instead of using it for the greater good, it's been captured by uh, interest, greed, self-service, uh, which is rife. And instead of using it, all of our technology and our brilliance and genius for greater good, we, we use it for self-service. And that's not going to work. It's important that we look at our civilization, our place in history, use our tools of science for greater understanding, to promote the greater good, and that's what it's all about. The issue is not the election. The election is a battle in a war. It is not something unto itself. The result of this election in itself is a matter of indifference. It's a question of how the, how the battle is won and lost, which is important. We have obviously two disasters running for president, though one has a good constituency, that is Obama has a very large constituency, which is important. It is sensitive to the lower 80% of family income brackets as the top of the Obama campaign is not. It's on the other side. But uh, the Hillary's campaign is significant, but the issue is that forces in Britain 
with their stooges in the United States have said that a Hillary Clinton election, even a nomination, would mean that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton would be in the White House. And this, the British Empire, such as it is, and its lackeys in Washington and elsewhere, are determined it shall not happen. And you're talking about methods such as assassination, if deemed necessary to prevent Hillary from becoming president. It was not just the Republicans who turned out en masse to vote for Obama in yesterday's Indiana and also North Carolina campaigns. That's what the margin was there. That's not the issue. That's part of the fraud. This was a gigantic fraud. I sat there at the television set and watched this thing coming down the last phases. And I saw something that from my nose I could see the stink all over the place. This election was totally fraudulent. Exactly how the fraud was exercised, we know one thing. There was a massive turnout of Republican and related vote for Obama in Raleigh Durham. In contrast to other cities in North Carolina where the expected result was going along until the last minute when a miracle occurred. Voters had not, who had not yet been born were flooding the polls at the last minute of the polls. We've seen this sort of thing before. So the issue is, the issue is not, but there's another issue here. There's also an issue of World War III. And World War III is between the British Empire, better known as the Anglo-Dutch liberal banking financial system on the one side, and the principal nations of Eurasia, Russia, China, India, and other nations are the targets of intended warfare by the British Empire, which is already turning Europe, into uh, continental Europe, into a mere colony of the British Empire through the program of the Lisbon Treaty. If the Lisbon Treaty were adopted, and is being pushed for adoption now, there would not be a single nation on the continent of Europe, west of Belarus and Russia, which had any sovereignty whatsoever. The British Empire would control the entirety of that region of Europe, from Portugal to the borders of Belarus and Russia, as a puppet of the Anglo-Dutch liberal financial interests. It is those interests represented in the United States who, uh, who have, for a long time, especially since 1971-72, have taken over control of the U.S. dollar, control of the United States. Now they're moving in for the kill. And that's the issue. The issue is the fools think that uh, in the Democratic Party, they're all, the people at the top are generally largely corrupt in this thing. They're lying their heads off. I watched some of them lie on, the, on television. I lost some of the, all the uh, commentators, the uh, television commentators lying like hell about what was going on right over their nose on television. And you could see the facts and you could see what they were saying. Two different things. But you're looking at a war between an empire run by London, not necessarily the British, all the British people, but it's by the Anglo-Dutch liberal financier cartel. The same cartel that put Mussolini into power in Italy, the same cartel that put Hitler into power in Germany. And we're now at the brink of something like a Hitler power taking over the United States. If they grab the United States, then they will grab all of Europe out of the Lisbon Treaty. If they control the United States and the parts of Europe under the Lisbon Treaty, huh, then you will have an actual fighting war emerging on this planet against the continent of Africa and much of the continent of Asia and other places. You will have dictatorship. You will have mass starvation. The elimination of whole sections of the population of, of parts of the world through starvation. And that's part of the British program. It's, it's, a, it's the food war. We now have a situation which I'll get into on the on this on the background. But that's the that's the situation. We're not dealing with an election. We're dealing with whether there is in the United States, in the top layers of society, the moral fitness to survive. And so far, the vote is in the leadership of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Neither is morally fit to survive. 
They're as unmorally fit to survive as the people who backed Mussolini and backed Hitler back in the 1920s and the 1930s. And if we allow this to happen, we will get the same kind of treatment that the victims of Mussolini, Hitler, and so forth suffered. That's where we stand. We have to win this war against that evil empire. That's been the long-standing fight. For me, it's a long-standing fight ever since I've had service in Asia toward the end of the last World War. Where I was in northern Burma, now called uh, Myanmar, and in, in Calcutta area, in, uh, in Bengal. And I saw the British Empire face up in those circumstances and elsewhere. I know the British Empire. Truman was a victim of the British Empire. Look at what, there's just a case of this thing. Franklin Roosevelt, the intention, at the close of World War II, before he died, his intention at that period, was to eliminate colonialism and all forms of imperialism for this planet. His intention was that once the peace had been secured, that the power of the United States developed through its agro-industrial and scientific power, which is the greatest power this planet had ever seen from any single source. If this power was going to be used by converting the war machine, which the United States had assembled to deal with the war against Hitler, to assemble that machine and transform it into a machine of production, and as Roosevelt spelled out specifically, to take nations and continents like Africa the colonial nations of the world, and free them, not only by giving them political freedom, but by giving them economic assistance and technology to solve their problems, where they could emerge from being colonies and prey to being essentially self, self-determining. And Roosevelt's intention for the United Nations was to perform a receptacle called the United Nations. Now, a couple of years ago, Art Bell had a chance to talk with John Lear. John's going to be our guest in just a few moments. And they were talking about what we now have called the John Lear Disclosure Briefing. And, you know, Art was uh, talking about, okay, what if the government asked me, Art Bell, to sit in on a disclosure meeting about UFOs? And then I had to make a decision on whether I was going to tell all of you just whether they were here or not, real or not, what would I do? Very compelling And I want you to just listen to this because it'll set the stage for tonight's interview with John Lear. Okay, let's say the government chose me. Uh, They were going to use me as an outlet to release this information. Let's just say they did that and they took me to a briefing. Then what, John? Okay, we whisk you to, or they whisk you to Washington, D.C. You get limoed to this building, beautiful building. You go up into this room. Uh, they say, Art, you're the guy. Um, if you give us the go-ahead, we're going to release everything we know to the public. And if you decide to go ahead, all major networks will be provided with information on all aspects of the cover-up. No type of information will be withheld because of the deal for immunity for all participants of the cover-up provides that nothing, no artifact, no piece of information be withheld. So here's what happened, Art. Uh, and, of course, this will call, uh, uh, we'll use some videos and stills. Our first UFO recoveries were in the late 30s. We made a couple in the beginning of the 40s, and then came Roswell, which the public found out about. We got two live aliens from Roswell. One died shortly thereafter. One lived until 1956. And we found out that so far there are 18 different alien species that we know about monitoring Earth. Some are good, some are hostile. Most are indifferent. Uh, we found out that we are the experiment or product, if you will, of an alien race who we never met and really don't know who they are. All we know is that the greys are cybernetic organisms, glorified robots, if you will, who work here at the behest of their employers, monitoring us through abductions. Uh, we were never able to find out what the experiment is all about, except that we have been externally corrected about 65 times, and they, the aliens, refer to us as containers. There has been speculation that the souls our bodies contains is the reason for the experiment, but nothing has been proven or determined. Since 1938, we have lost over 200 aircraft to UFO hostilities and thousands of soldiers in all kinds of different kinds of action with aliens. Since that time, several hundred thousand civilians have disappeared with no trace. 
<clears throat> several thousand were eliminated by us because of their chance encounters with aliens, which we could ill afford to have publicized. A slightly more frightening phenomenon known as human mutilations have occurred on a regular basis and are similar to the cattle mutilations in that the humans or humans are taken from the street, so to speak, and returned to the same area about 45 minutes to an hour later with their rectums cored out, their genitals removed, their eyes removed from their sockets, and completely drained of blood. In all cases, it appears that the mutilation procedures occurred while the persons were still alive and conscious. One of our scientists speculated that apparently the human specimens had to be alive for the samples to be worth anything. Abductions occur on a daily basis throughout the United States to at least 10% of the population. And when we first became aware of this, we protested to the little gray being that we held in the captivity at the YY2, uh, YY-2 facility at Los Alamos. But a deal was struck that in exchange for advanced technology from the aliens, we would allow them to abduct a very small number of persons, and we would be periodically given a list of those persons abducted. We got something less than the technology we bargained for and found that the abductions exceeded by a millionfold what we had naively agreed to. In 1954, President Eisenhower met with a representative of another alien species at Miroc Test Center, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base. This alien suggested that they could help us get rid of the graves, but Eisenhower turned down their offer because... They offered no technology. At this, at this point, it became apparent to all involved that there was no such thing as a god, at least as the public perceives god. Certainly some kind of computer recorder stores information, and an occasional miracle is displayed by the aliens to influence a religious event. So this, this so unnerved Eisenhower that he had, in God we trust, put on paper money and coins and put into the Pledge of Allegiance to reaffirm the public belief in God. Shortly after this, it was determined at meetings between the U.S. and Russians that the situation was serious enough that a Cold War should be manufactured as a ruse to divert attention of the public away from UFOs and towards some other scary threat, the H-bomb. Wow. It was also decided to keep the ruse secret from any elected or appointed official within both the U.S. and Russian government as long as, uh, as it took so long to vet these uh, officials and the ruse was easier to manage if the top people did know about it. In the late 1950s, NASA was formed to compartmentalize, containerize, and sanitize information from all space platforms and vehicles. We sold NASA to the public, claiming that all information would belong to them. Actually, they got very little, and even that was highly sanitized. Our first efforts were to keep the public from learning about Venus, uh, and that it's a similar planet to Earth, and that its population is very similar to us, but more technologically advanced. Uh, we have learned a lot from them. Starting with the Russian Venera 1 and U.S. Mariner 2, we made Venus look like a lead-melting volcanic surface spewing sulfuric acid into a pressurized atmosphere 90 times that of Earth. And it was often the case we overdid it and wondered why no one ever asked how a parachute survived the descent into 800-degree air. We set up operations in Pine Gap, Australia to preclude any prying eyes trying to figure out what we were up to. We regularly eliminated, through extreme prejudice, anybody who was part of the operation and made the least little tiny threat about disclosure or satisfaction with the operation. Any space mission that included Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Mariner, Voyager, Clementine, and all the rest, all data initially came transmitted to Pine Gap, and then it was relayed to JPL or wherever uh, after the sanitizing. We had a little trouble with amateur radio operators, uh, but we figured out when they figured out how they could intercept these signals, but we managed to deal with that. When the Russian threat began to fade, we introduced Vietnam, which kept the public occupied for over 10 years. The cover-up and the personnel to run the operation began to get bigger and bigger and required more and more money. We were enforced to inflate the defense budget, which soon was not enough. Then we got into the drug business, which was still not enough. We were the ones that looted the savings and loan industry and Wall Street to boot. It is so out of control now, most people want immunity and want out. There, but there is so much secrecy and so many double and triple blinds in place that it is unlikely that this thing can ever be dismantled. And even if you give us the go-ahead to spill the beans to the public, it's unlikely they will get anything more than, yes, we recovered a flying saucer, and yes, there was an occupant, but that's all we're going to tell you.